Lewis family. Um, I, I have a need to, to just see a little bit of this. Um, there's a, there's a song, um, a little song in, in my mind. It's a very simple song. It's a, we refer to it as smooth.
Skal vi de gjøre vant? Ikke tom lirkinas for blåser en sal av mange. Matthias 5 vers 3 wil vir ons iets belangrijk sê. Hy sê, geseend is die ene wat weet hoe afhankelijk hy van God is. Want in hom behoor. Ons kom nooit met arrogantie. Ons kom nooit met die gesintheid dat ons alles weet en alles verstaan. Ons kom maar net en ons skuil met die heren. So vriende, welkom by die hierdie tyd van aanbidding. Um, and please join me this morning as we invite each other into a time of worship. Come bless the Lord, in whom we find our refuge and safety. Come bless the Lord who gives us rich inheritance and surrounds us with abundance. Come bless the Lord who guides us on the path of eternal life, whose presence strengthens and sustains us. Come on, spit some in and tear yourself on the land for bed to announce the Lord's praise also.
voor die tijd van die in december het een beetje sê ek, uh, in die oude het ons gepraat van die lange gebeen. Uh, en, uh, en ek denk, dit was baie keer te letterlik interpreteer, so het die ook een gebeen van Lof, Press en die dan bid. So baie, baie dankie daarvoor. Um, dear friends, it's, it's, it's really my joy to be able to welcome you. Uh, you know that this is your father's house. You know that this is the house where all of us are, are welcomed by God. We know that this is the house of God where, where God comforts us through His Spirit. But it's also the house where sometimes that very same word will also um, disturb us. Um, it will sometimes also unsettle us. Because part of the, 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 you know, the purpose of the Word of God is, is that it really ministers to us um, in, in different ways and it, it operates as a two-edged sword. So welcome to all of you um, this morning um, in, the, in the service and we, we pray that God would bless all of us um, as, we, as we gather here this morning. I would ask that we all, um, in terms of the announcements, that we refer to, to the announcements that we send out on a weekly basis. Um, we, we receive it, so please just take two minutes, perhaps just a minute, to, to read through it so that you know what is, what is happening within the church this, this morning. Um, I had to ask Joe to, to do something else. Uh, you know, sometimes things happen and you just need to um, work with it. Um, Maxwell? That, can you work with it? Huh? Um, so, sometimes I become, you know, over enthusiastic with, with the songs and, and so on. And, and I, I say to myself, oh, this is well known. And then I realize it's not so well known. Um, let us sing together the, the hymn, My Jesus, I Love You. <coughs> Uh, 
beloved, may the peace of the Lord that transcends all understanding be with you. Let us share the peace of the Lord.
So, so these are the these these are. Uh,
may we honor God now with our time. and reach for your dreams and reach for your purpose. Happy birthday.
Gracious God, thanks and praise be, praise to be, be unto your holy name. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you that you've blessed our, our daughter with, with a new year added to her life. Thank you, Lord, that we, that we begin to understand that as we journey through life, that experience is not necessarily the things that happen to us, but really what we do with what happens to us. Bless her as she experiences life every day. May she grow. And may she be a blessing to those around her. Thank you, Lord, that you are with all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear friends, our, our reading this morning is taken from the, the Acts of the Apostles, and we will read from Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 8, from verse 26. I read to you from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert. So he, he arose and went, and behold, the man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had, had charge of all the treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? He said, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in, this, in, the, in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his, in his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself? Or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road they came to some water and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized them. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip, caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus and passed through. He preached in all the cities, still came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Praise the Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Um, I, I realize that, that I have a few minutes to, to share, and I, I remember one of, our, one of our ministers that mentored me when I was younger, uh, the Reverend Percy Mack. Uh, often in, in, he would say to me, listen, he, he was all it's the field prat and the field for David. Prat let the bitty know so that he more and not where it's he can say. Um, and I, <laughs> I've been wrestling with that well because I, when I, when I read a text, I, I want to exegete, we call, uh, you know, we do exegesis of a text. And then after the exegesis, we have to do the hermeneutics of the text. Um, and, and preaching is, the thing about preaching is, it is not um, a reading of a text. Preaching is allowing the Holy Word of God to flow through you 
And sometimes when you, because I've got my written text here, everything is here. But sometimes you receive bread from heaven, straight from the oven. And you've got to give it, you know, you can't put it on paper. So, so um, but I'll try to. So, Uncle P, Uncle Percy would normally have a little alarm. <laughs> and you start talking and then, uh, you know, you're not done yet and the alarm goes off. Time off. Dear brothers and sisters, friends and family, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. So, today's message that I'm bringing to you was really triggered by a conversation in which someone suggested that Christianity was brought to Africa by European missionaries. Of course, in that conversation, I said, no, 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 no that's, that's not quite the story. But I said, no, missionaries brought it here. I said, well, let's look at history and um, but before I take you to, to other historical sources, let's just look at the Bible so that we begin to see that, that, Africa, that, that Africa really had a very significant contribution to, to the Christian tradition. And so this past Wednesday during our dwelling in the Word, I used the same text and we looked at the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. But, you know, we, we refer to him as the eunuch in Afrikaans. The Kusit Soltes, um, Kusit Kushite, Kush is also Ethiopia. Um, he was the finance minister. He was in charge of the, the treasury of the queen of, of Ethiopia. So we, we spoke about it this week, and I, and I must say, the Wednesday gathering is a tremendous blessing to me. Because we, we dwell in the word, we read the word together, and we, we talk about the word together. And as we were discussing this week, the comments and the questions really, really, really just blessed me. And I, I had a desire to, to continue. So, so that was Wednesday. Then on Thursday, now wait, 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 let me just say this. As I was preparing for Wednesday, I actually wrote a line because I was talking about the importance when you read the story of Philip, you see how he actually preached and how he was able to explain scripture. And, and I wrote a line in my preparation that was on Tuesday. Um, it is a shame that, that, that Christians and often Christian leaders would hide when a Jehovah's Witness knock on their door. That was the line that I wrote. I didn't say it, but it was written there. And so on Thursday, Thursday morning, I, had a, I was visited by some zealous and sincere Jehovah's Witnesses reaching out to me um, and, and it was really funny I, I visited it the other day and here they come and visit me but it, for me it was a wonderful time of of dwelling in the word with brothers and sisters um, who interpret scripture rather differently focusing you know writing a whole theology around just the name of God. So, in our text this morning, dear friends, we, we meet uh, Philip, uh, Philip um, the Evangelist. Uh, the name, his people would not call him Philip, that's the English word, but his people would actually call him Philippos. Um, so Luke tells us that Philip was one of the seven chosen to care for the poor. Remember in the early church the situation where they distributed food and, uh, you know, based on the needs of people. And there was a dispute because the Greek-speaking um, people came, the, the Greek-speaking widows came and said, um, we feel that uh, you are discriminating against us and you are favoring the Jews more. And based on that complaint, the apostles got together and they said, let us choose at that stage only men. Let us choose men that are full of the Holy Spirit so that they can assist with the benevolent task of the church so that we as apostles can focus on, on, the, on studying the word and, and praying. So Philip then was one of those that were chosen in that first Christian community in, in Jerusalem. Luke also tells us that, that Philip lived in Caesarea Maritima with his daughters. He had four daughters. And the daughters were interestingly gifted with the gift of prophecy. Also, when we read Acts chapter 21, we read that Paul 
uh, also visited Paul, um, Philip and his daughters. So Luke tells us that in order for Philip to be chosen as a deacon, he had to be full of the Holy Spirit and a person of wisdom. Remember that when we choose deacons again, right? Because in our tradition, we just we just choose. Je moet die kerk heel kerk en je praat nu nogal baie. So, wil jy nie staan met drie jaar. He was chosen because he was full of the Holy Spirit and he was a man of wisdom. So today we introduced our confirmation group to you as a congregation and we have welcomed a new disciple, um, not so new disciple, a tester. Um, and we have also introduced Tammy as, as, as our pastoral inquirer from the Belgo Church. All of them people that are coming to say we want to serve God, we want to honor God, we want to follow Jesus in this world. I therefore want to lift up Philip. For I believe that Philip presents to us a model for discipleship that should be explored. Philip's familiarity therefore with scripture, his relationship with his Savior and his being He's being grasped by and controlled by the Spirit makes him someone that we should be looking up to as followers and disciples of Jesus. It is interesting and it's very clear that Philip knew Scripture. Philip understood Scripture despite the fact that Scripture was limited. He was only previously exposed to the Torah, the Old Testament that we know. So he had that. But then also he had the story of Jesus. He had the story of the resurrected Christ, which at that stage was not yet written, written down. If we emulate Philip, we should be able to correct someone who suggests that Christianity is a Western religion and had nothing to do with Africa. And Africa had no uh, bearing on the growth of the Christian faith. Just remember this. <coughs> And this was part of my conversation with a brother who suggested that uh, Christianity is a Western religion. Constantine, the first Roman emperor who became a Christian, only became a Christian in the 4th century. Christianity arrived in Africa. Well, the Christ, the Christ, Jesus, our Savior, arrived in Africa for the first time as a refugee. Jesus was a baby. Remember that story? Jesus, his family had to flee because of Herod. They ended up in Egypt, in Africa. Right? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go to um, Sub-Saharan Africa and, you know, Africa um, beyond the Sahara. This is, is, is Africa. Jesus came here with his family. They were given refuge and they've been given grace on this continent. However, the first this, uh, ev uh, evangelism that happened in Africa happened the year after the resurrection of Jesus. A year after his resurrection, the Christian gospel was preached on, on African soil. So brothers and sisters, it is important to know scriptures. It's also important to know a little bit of, of history. Um, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a Rastafarian by the name of Bob Marley. He, he, he wrote down some beautiful lyrics. He said, If you know your history, <laughs> no cannons come on. <laughs> then you would know where you're coming from, eh? If, if, if you know history, if you know something of your history, you have a sense of who you are and your identity and and the, the knowledge of who you are and where you're coming from has got the ability to, to assist you in putting down your steps in this world and moving, moving forward. Philip knew the Bible. No, not the Bible. Philip knew Scripture. Philip is therefore someone that we can look at. It's important, friends, to know Scriptures. Luke tells us in his gospel in the fourth chapter that the devil also knew scripture. Remember? Jesus in the desert. The devil came to him with scripture. The devil said to him, it is written. And Jesus says, it is also written. So Jesus fired straight back from, from scripture. 
So, so it's really important that in this day and age, in this postmodern world, in this um, globalized village, that we actually read the Bible in order to have a basis from where to not really defend our faith, but be able to navigate our world, our, our way through a world that is full of different ideologies and different positions. And so in the story, Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at the scripture in Isaiah, which this Ethiopian man was reading, beginning with Isaiah, he preached Jesus to this Ethiopian man. Philip started with a prophetic word and revealed the living word to this man. Something interesting. At the beginning of chapter 8, we read about the great persecution and how the believers were scattered. And Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. He goes to a place and a people which he was told by his culture and his socialization that he shouldn't associate with. Isn't this, isn't this, this amazing? Chapter 8. After the persecution, Paul started with the persecution. His name was still Saul then. They were scattered completely. And it was Philip that went to Samaria because the risen Savior did something to him. This is amazing, friends. The Jesus that Philip preached is a Jesus who breaks down walls of hatred. It's a Jesus that breaks down walls of prejudice. It's a Jesus that breaks down walls of culture and language that separates people. It's a Jesus that embraces. But let me get back to our original text. An Ethiopian Jew, an Ethiopian Jew in the New Testament, this man is an Ethiopian. He went to Jerusalem to go and worship Jerusalem. He worshipped within the context of the Jewish faith. So, so that's, that's something interesting. So we should be asking, well, so where do these, where do the Jews come, the Ethiopians come from who all of a sudden are Jews now? I mean, people, when, sometimes, you know, when, when we hear about Ethiopian Jews, we hear about Falasha or Falashia. Now that's not the word that they would use for themselves. That word Falashia or Falasha, that's the word that the neighbors that other people use to refer to them because Falasha really means stranger or wanderer or exile. But, but they refer to themselves as the Kaila. Kaila or sometimes and most often uh, Beta Israel, um, House of Israel. Where do they come from? Now of course there are different theories and, and history is, remember the thing about history, we need to read history carefully because history is often written by those in power and we have also discovered how when the, when the, uh, the Greek culture started developing uh, as one of the dominant cultures, how they started to change narratives also. The changing of the way history is also rewritten in South Africa, I mean, we, we, we see it all the time. The, so the one theory is that the Ethiopian Jews are the descendants of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Right? We know that he had all these wives, he, he loved women. Um, luckily God gave him some wisdom. <laughs> Uh, so so that, is, that is the one, that is the one. There, there's another, there's another uh, um, theory that it, it is um, possibly one of the lost tribes of Israel. Because we, we've heard about the lost tribes of Israel. And, and then there's another story of during the, during the Exodus that, uh, remember Moses got married to an Ethiopian woman. Remember that story? <coughs> Moses married a woman from Africa. Um, a black woman and his sister was angry. His sister, her racism got the better of her and she, she started to, to, to you know, have lots of stories with Moses and then God punished her for her racism. Do you know that story? Read the Bible. It's, it's all there so that we can sort of understand certain things. 
So he was married to an Ethiopian woman, and there's a theory that during the Exodus, there was a group that moved south, and they ended up in, in, in Kush, the valley of Kush, Ethiopia. Uh, so uh, that's, that's, let me stop with the history now. But the point is, all these, throughout these years, throughout these centuries, Jews were in, um, in Ethiopia. Uh, those of you who read more contemporary history will remember that in, uh, I think it's 68, um, there was Project Solomon, where Israel um, took Jews, the Phanasha, which they refer, are referred to, and took them to, to, to Israel. Uh, go, go and read in your, in your own time. So, this man was on his way back after worshipping in Jerusalem. The Spirit then commands Philip to go to him, and as he went to, to the Ethiopian, he invited him to, to interpret the text that he was reading. And so Philip, when he said, um, do you understand what, what you're reading? And he says, how can I understand if no one tells me the this, this, this scriptures? He got onto the chariot and started interpreting that particular text that really talks about Jesus as a suffering Messiah. And, and as he interprets the text, he says, Jesus is the one who was among us. He, he was born among us. He lived among us. He lived a common life. But eventually, he had this amazing ministry that he eventually, he died on the cross. But he didn't stop there. He was raised from the dead and he ascended into heaven. Based on the preaching, the Ethiopian confessed Jesus as the Son of God and he was summarily baptized. The, the Ethiopian then went on his way rejoicing and take, took the gospel of Jesus into Africa. That's why today you have the, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church in Ethiopia. That's why today you have ancient texts written in the, the Ethiopian language, the Gais language, um, and, and it's blessed the Christian community over the years. But I want us to look at this man quickly. This man is an Ethiopian, but throughout the text they refer to him as a eunuch. A eunuch. Um, now there are also there are different things. There are those that have been um, generally those that work for the kings and the queens. If you work closely with the queen, um, they would remove, um, help me now, he's a doctor, I, I need her to help me now. <laughs> they would remove your testicles. Can I get in the captain? So they remove the testicles, so, so in a sense you become impotent. Right? Um, in Afrikaans, what the can on money So So there's, there's that eunuch, but there is also, we, we refer about between congenital eunuch and, you know, eunuchs that, whose testicles have been removed. They were always the people that worked close to the queens because they needed to be harmless. There was deep shame associated with being a eunuch. This man is the minister of finance in Ethiopia and he's a eunuch. So despite of the fact that he is a person of prestige and esteem, he walks with a great deal of shame. And if you read the text, you will, you will see how they, they introduce him as, the, if you need the, read the New Living Translation, for instance, they introduce him as, as the minister of finance. They introduce him as the one in charge of the treasury. But then they use this word of shame throughout. Yunak, yunak, yunak. In Afrikaans, onmande, onmande, onmande. I was wondering about it last week. And it dawned on me as we were gathering here, during the questions and the comments, 
that the writer, Luke, is very intentional here to talk about the God that we serve. That this man walking with so much shame, despite all that he has, walking with shame and being labeled and being boxed in, he was able to discover in this Savior, in this Jesus, someone that saves and saves completely. Someone that loves and loves completely. For the eunuchs, especially within the religious traditions, were often ostracized. And here, he gets the news of a Savior that loves completely, embraces completely, and redeems completely. And the text concludes by saying, he went on his way, rejoicing. You see, this is the thing about the gospel of Jesus. It enables us to go home rejoicing. Dr. Jeremiah Wright tells a, a story. He, he tells of people who were building a, a church in Chicago. Where he was at, at Chicago, Trinity, Chicago. And they were building a church and he, he went there. And he said it, it was such a treat for him just to go there um, in a very unassuming way and listen to the team building, the, the, the group of builders. And he says this one day he went there and they, they were busy with the, with the steeple of the church. And he says, you know, these guys, they, not all of them are Christians and they were making fun and, you know, as they were busy with the steeple and, and they started talking about scripture and he, said, and he said, the one guy said, hey, you know, it would have been lovely to, to, to be present at that wedding where Jesus produced all those liters of wine. So that, that, would have been, that would have been wonderful. You know, so, so they go through the different stories and, uh, um, and they, you know, and there was one guy, so they went through several stories, making fun of, you know, talking lightly of all the different stories in the Bible. And there was one guy that didn't uh, participate in all the jokes. And they said to him, hey, you, you don't like what we're saying here. And he was quiet. He said, hey, we're talking to you. you. Something wrong with what we are saying? And the man said to him, well, I don't joke about the things that are holy to me. Um, and he said, no, what's, what's wrong with what we are saying? He said, you know, I wasn't there at that wedding to see how it turned water into wine. But I know how it turned brandy into school fees. <laughs> he said, I was, I was there and I know how it turned a drunk into a sober follower of Jesus. He says, you know, I, I wasn't there and I didn't see any of these, but I, I, I know the stories and I believe them because I was just such a wretched individual, but saved by the grace of God. This is the gospel that we preach. It's a gospel that convicts. It's a gospel that transforms. It's a gospel that can send us all rejoicing. May God bless you, now and forevermore. Amen. Dear Barriere, wij thank you for your great genade and liefde. Thank you for your sin and thank you that you are a big genade for your Heilige Word. And dear, that you are a word can deal with each other. Thank you for your deep in your Heilige Word. And thank you that you are a good place where you are. Jere, ek besef hoe hierdie woord gewone sikkelende mense kom ontmoet. Ek besef hoe hierdie woord mense kom ontmoet in hulle sondige toestand en vir hulle nie wil hebben kom vir. Maar jere, dit was ook ek wat met lastige loop het. 
Dit was ook ek wat met baie sonde geworstel het en nog steeds worstel. Maar dat die heilige woord, dat u die heilige woord, vir ons nooi, vir my nooi en elke nooi, so dat ons ris en vrede by u kan kan. Ek dank u, Heer. En ek dank u vir die vele stories van u genade. In Jesus naam met ons. Amen. Ek wil jy iets sê. He touched me and he made me whole. Jesus as Lord and Savior. Niks taak sy goed in. Niks malligheid. Net om te weet. Net om te weet. Jesus moet as my salig maak. Net dit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest in the Bible with all of us, now and forevermore.